Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Experimental Cataclysm, the show where we talk about recent changes to the experimental version of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. We once again have a pretty light show this week. Development lately just has not had any major developments or mechanics that I'm aware of, so let's just get into the video. So first up today from Mari Mariki, we've got an improvement to the pathing of intelligent monsters. Now this changes their behavior and makes their AI a lot better for navigating towards the player. Now this applies only for intelligent monsters. Zombies are still big dummies, so you don't have to worry about their behavior changing. So what exactly does this mean? Well, you've probably seen this old behavior at some time or another. A group of enemies hear you, but there's a wall between you and them. And so the enemies just stack up on the other side of the wall standing around or trying to walk through the wall to you but they can't actually get to you and this makes sense for zombies because they're very dumb but it doesn't really make sense for smarter enemies like ferals or uh, migo i mean not that ferals are particularly smart but they are capable of opening doors and would probably understand that they shouldn't just walk into a wall because they heard a sound on the other side of it now there is a video in this pr that shows the new behavior of the uh, new pathing that was added here now this shows a player with for Migo in various rooms around them, and then the player shouts. The Migo know that they are there because they hear that noise, and so they begin pathing, which you can see they leave the rooms and enter through the door to get to the player. Now once the path to the player has been blocked by their fellow Migo, the fourth creature realizes this, paths outside, and then comes in through the window where they too can reach the player. So this is obviously a pretty big improvement. It's much more, I mean, it's relatively complex behavior compared to what we had previously. The pathing just was never that good and did not account for things like friendly creatures blocking the way. So although I don't know everything about this, I, you know, I definitely am not smart enough to understand AI behaviors in general. But despite my lack of understanding these simple improvements, like not pathing through tiles that can't be mounted, like a wall, or trying to path through your friendly companions, these are good improvements. Or I'm sorry, I mean they don't path through their friendly companions, which is a good thing, because zombies would just stack up on each other and not really do anything. This should ultimately lead to more dynamic experiences when you're fighting a more intelligent enemy, and yeah, it just seems like an objectively good thing to me. So in the end, we're just going to have to see how this all shakes out in gameplay, and of course we'll offer our feedback once we play the game with it for a while. I mostly think this is a good thing. People very rarely improve our AI, so yeah, this just seems objectively good to me. Next up today, we've got a series of rabbit-related PRs from Carol and uh, E. Hughes Baird. Now, there was quite a lot here in the various PRs. Some of them were tweaked later, things like that. Now, one of the main things, I believe, is a separation between domesticated rabbits and those that you would find in the wild. Okay, and to come in here as the editor, originally this segment talked a lot about the rabbit's speed, which initially was changed from like 100 and something, I don't remember, to 666. So I talked about this at length because uh, at 666 speed, obviously there would be a lot of difficulty for the player to interact with those rabbits. However, apparently there was a PR that actually reined that back, so they now have a speed of 300, so I'm just going to cut a huge section out of this segment of the video. So there's going to be an awkward cut, sorry about that, and we're just going to talk about some of the other aspects of these rabbit-related PRs. Now there were quite a lot of other changes as well to things like how frequently rabbits will breed, how many offspring they will have, and how quickly those rabbits will then become adults. Also, some of the phrasing here made me think they previously produced adult offspring. I'm not 100% on that, but they should now produce kits instead of adults, if that was a thing before. Now, very few people actually raise rabbits in the game, even in the long term. It's just not something most people do. So, although I think a lot of this is pretty nice, I don't think very many players will actually be affected in a significant way. There are links to the PRs in the description of this video if you would like to take a closer look at all the things that were changed. Next up today from StubCon, we've got three variants for roadblocks and a rebalance to the loot that you're going to find there. Now, I'm sure that many of you have seen these roadblocks in the game and they definitely have changed over the years that I've been playing. Nowadays, all these barricades tend to have the exact same layout with less than lethal turrets, a vehicle or maybe two vehicles, I don't know, and a spotlight. Now, I almost always found them 
surrounded by zombies as well, even though they could be very rural. So these spawns seem like they're attached to that location specifically. And these roadblocks that I'm talking about here are the ones that are found randomly on roads. They are not the like blockade, minefieldy, whatever thing that you might find at a bridge occasionally. Well, now there are three new variations added for these barricades, and I'm just going to read you kind of the descriptions that were presented here by the author. So first up is a roadblock with turrets. This will spawn one to four of them at random in different spots of the blockade. The zombies here are already dead, so unless you give them time to reanimate, you will only find corpses. Now this does include zombies and police corpses as well, with appropriate loots for whatever the enemy type is. They did mention in the PR that they kind of dislike that barricades would often be kind of pointless because the turrets would attack the zombies and the zombies would attack the turrets, and so the player could kind of freely move around. And so at this layout, the zombies are already dead, which means the player will have to deal directly with the turrets. And in some of the other ones we're going to discuss, it's kind of flipped the opposite, where it's zombies but no turrets. Anyway, the second layout is a roadblock with no turrets, although it does appear to still have a spotlight. Now, if I recall correctly, base level enemies can't destroy spotlights, so it's probably going to be there when you arrive. I guess they still attack them. I'm not 100% on that. Now, zombies have already overwhelmed this checkpoint, and so the police that once manned this location have either been killed and their corpses are here or they've escaped. There are 9mm casings scattered around the area as well as some human remains and a decent number of zombies milling about over their kills. Now the third layout is a roadblock that contains a vehicle crash. The image provided still does contain a spotlight but no turrets. An SUV attempted to run the barricade and plowed into a police vehicle which has left some wreckage behind. Again, there are remains in the area, but there is a zombie presence, again speaking to the barricade having been overrun. Now, some of the other changes in the PR were related to loot. With a reduced military presence at these blockades, they were replaced instead with police, who of course have lower tier loot than a soldier zombie. Although in the zombie apocalypse, let's be honest, the police that are tasked with arming barricades like this against the zombie menace would fully deploy with assault rifles and whatnot. They would not just be you know, uh, Barney Fife with a sidearm standing out there. But that's not really, I mean, it's not a big deal. I do think, you know, depending on the time at which they kind of form these barricades, maybe it would be police. It doesn't really matter. Now, the only thing I saw in this PR that I actually would push back on is that the author believes these barricades should spawn significantly more frequently than they do currently. Now, I really strongly disagree with this. Most of these barricades are in extremely rural areas that have essentially no strategic significance. They already, in my opinion, spawn much more frequently than they should. I can't think of any reason why police would set up a roadblock in the middle of a country road. And it's not just, oh, it's in a country road. It has empty fields on either side most of the time, which allows them to be easily circumvented. What are they blockading a random country road for? There's just nothing of significance out there. And I did also see someone submitted an issue, someone else uh, complaining about how rare they are, but I really firmly believe that increasing their frequency makes no sense from a realism perspective. If anything, these sort of checkpoint barricades should be appearing inside of cities, where it makes much more sense to have a security checkpoint and where it would have much more impact on the player's movement. It would also allow us to remove their zombie spawns and we could just have the natural spawns in the area of zombies congregate at these checkpoints to attack the turrets and spotlights. If someone can submit a good reason why we need multiple barricades in random country roads that would see very little traffic during a zombie apocalypse and very little population in the area for them to contain, then maybe I would feel differently. I don't know. Anyway, other than that, I have no real thoughts here. It's just neat to see a little map gen coming out. It's, like I said, it's been a pretty heavy lack of new content lately, so I was pretty happy to see this. Anyway, moving on. Next up today from Patrick Lundell, we've got an expansion of terrain that is valid for faction camps. Now, this comes up a lot. The only official map tile that can be used for expansion, as far as I know, was the one called a field. However, people were very often confused about this. They didn't really understand that field referred to a map tile of that name. It wasn't farm fields or hay fields. And we did have that massive expansion of locations a couple years ago that like would let you make a camp in more places, but in order to expand, you still required a field tile, as far as I know. Well, now this PR makes it so that hay and farm field map tiles, as well as dirt roads, 
roads that appear on field type like grass locations are valid places for expansion. Now this is a great step and I think it's going to alleviate some of the confusion for newer players that did mix up the different field types. Now in a perfect world we would obviously let you convert basically any empty-ish map tile but that's just not how the game is set up unfortunately. So for example in the PR they said they think that paddocks might be a plausible location as well to use for expansions but that it might be better to have some separate mechanism to allow players to first remove their fences and things like that then have them be valid. However, that is something, you know, maybe possible in the future. It's not been done in this PR. Now, they do also point out that dirt roads in forest areas are not valid here because they do generate with a lot of trees, and in that way, they're not really suitable. Now, really, regardless, I like this. It seems like a straightforward positive thing. Like, having an expansion for your faction camp is kind of crucial if you're going to be, like, building a robust camp. Although, I do think faction camps are still very underutilized by many players. They're a really cool aspect of the game and any expansion here is just pretty objectively great so I'm happy to see this. Next up today from Renick CDDA we've got a whole mess of changes for the Blob Lieutenant Shadow. Now this was a spoilery thing last time we talked about it but that was maybe two or three months ago so if you don't want spoilers at this point that's you know it's up to you to move to the next section of the video. Anyway when this creature was first added I had a lot of opinions on it mainly really like big concerns about its balance. Now this PR sought to address some of the most glaring issues with this creature and also attempted to balance some smaller things as well. So for example, previously it could fly, which <laughs> apparently was to allow it to avoid pits, but of course, you know, flying creatures are a huge headache on their own, and so its ability to fly was completely removed in this PR. Its regen was also knocked down from 5 points to 1 point per turn, which I am personally very happy to see. I think regen in general is a very powerful mechanic that is very often assigned a value that is way too high. Their bullet resistance was also lowered from 500 armor to 100 armor, and while this still has the same issue of making it essentially immune to the majority of gunfire, it is low enough now that apparently some of the highest damage firearms can deal damage to it. Now, I can't really think of any firearms off the top of my head that deal more than 100 damage per bullet other than the 50 cal. Now when I tested this creature originally, the thing that I had the biggest issue with were the hordes that it spawned and how difficult they were to kill with their average HP and I think they had like a 6 in their dodge skill. Now this PR gave their summons a shorter lifespan with a min and max value, usually around 30 seconds, as well as tweaking the weights for which summons will appear the most frequently. And while I do appreciate this, I think I think it's largely a token gesture since the summon cooldown seems very short and their dodge remains quite high, or like high enough that a mid-game player would struggle to dispatch them fast enough. Your goal here, remember, is to get rid of those enemies so you can get at the main bad guy and kill it. And the problem is, with the body blocking and living for 30 seconds and having a dodge skill of 6, it can be a real pain to do this. Now whenever I talk about this with people, they always tell me just, oh, just shoot the lieutenant with an anti-tank weapon and be done with it. But that's really not how your average player will be encountering the enemy, and I think in a prolonged encounter, this is still pretty problematic, especially given how hard it is to spot and pursue this enemy in an overgrown forest at night. Now the other thing that is often suggested is to use a heavy-duty flashlight, which produces light at a range far enough to highlight this enemy, who again, this enemy hates light, and it's a whole thing. Now apparently this makes the whole encounter trivial and it's very easy to deal with in that situation, although I have not done that myself. This is just what I've heard from like quite a few other players. Now unfortunately this is also not great because it just renders this interesting enemy pretty useless, uh, which is also not an ideal situation. And I think that we as players, we often come at this from the perspective of someone who's played quite a lot of the game. Like I've been around like, I don't know, for like six years now I've been a part of this community. I know a staggering amount about this game, just like a lot of you who are watching this are very invested in the development and very experienced players. And I think that's why people just say, oh, just use an anti-tank weapon. Oh, just use a heavy duty flashlight. It's trivial. It's not a big deal. But from the perspective of a new player who is encountering this for the first time, or even a mo like moderately experienced player who is just not prepared for that situation, I think it becomes a lot more complicated. It feels 
feels like for us it's very trivial and for them it's basically impossible. And I think that balancing that is incredibly difficult. And, and anyway, I really appreciate that some efforts were made to pull back a lot of the problematic elements of this creature and try to balance it. I still think it's a very powerful enemy, which of course it's designed to be. I just think the encounter is not very dynamic and will be a problem for many people for the stage of the game that it currently appears. I think for experienced players who are well prepared, this is a completely meaningless encounter, and I think for newer players, it is they view it as completely impossible. And that's really not good, in my opinion, and, and I don't blame, like, Rennick for this. I think it's, like, a really interesting idea. Like, I like the idea of the Blob Lieutenants, I just think balancing it is not an easy thing to do here. And I don't think that's a great end to that segment, but we're gonna move on here, and in fact, I'm jumping in as the editor again with a late addition here. Today, Kevin, the leader of the project, posted a video that was supposed to visualize the development of Cataclysm over the last 10 years or so. Now, it shows different aspects of the game, as well as contributor and developer names zipping around building up the project, and for me, watching it was somewhat nostalgic. I saw names of people that I remember, but who have since left our little community. It also contained things that made me smile, looking back to when Chest Hole was the dominant tile set, things like that, uh, that remind me of when I first started playing this game. I of course also scoured the video, looking for times when I previously had contributed in the past, until I did indeed see my name in that video. Now, I really enjoyed this, and I will put a link to the video in the description down below. Again, it's just a visual representation of our development over the last, like, 10 years. Now, it really showcases that, number one, this project has been around for quite a long time, but more importantly, number two, it shows that this game would not exist without the combined efforts of literally like, I don't know, probably a couple thousand people. I've never seen a complete list of contributors over the years, but I'm sure if you put together everyone who ever added content or submitted a bug report or play tested a new feature, surely it's, you know, it's in the thousands by now. Now I would encourage you to check this out if you haven't already. Again, link in the description as well as they posted this in the developer discord and all that kind of stuff. Also, I know I'm a very critical person I give a lot of negative feedback in these videos, but I do truly love this game, and I appreciate all of you who have helped piece this together into what I consider the best zombie game of all time, if not just the best all-around game of all time. And I think that is a wrap on the video. I was, initially I had recorded a little bit of a segment where I talked about uh, a recent change that I was very hesitant to talk about, but I actually think that it's best left unsaid for now. I originally was going to make it its own video, but I think the script came out a little too preachy and a little negative because I don't kind of like the way it's implemented currently. So it's probably better just not to talk about it. It's really not a, a big deal anyway. And I don't want to end on a negative note. We just had such a nice, positive, happy moment talking about the development of the game. So everyone, thank you for watching. Uh, apologies, as always, this video was later than it was supposed to be, but uh, I'll be back in a couple weeks with another episode. So I'll see you next time.